Now we're going to talk about the 1870s, which probably was the most impactful decade ever for the uh, tribes of the tribes of the Great Plains. There's a whole lot that happens that has some very um, long-term consequences. And that story begins with this guy, the American bison. There were millions of buffalo on the Great Plains, uh, more than enough to sustain the, the tribes that, that live there and, as, as you know, um, depended upon those herds for all kinds of things, not just for food and clothing, uh, but for uh, ritual, uh, ceremony, uh, and uh, identity, really. There was, uh, there was some limited trade in buffalo robes before 1870, but it was very limited. Buffalo robes were very, uh, very heavy and very warm, but you could only, uh, you could only get them from the, the herds in the northern plains where it was colder, where their coats grew longer, and then you could only get those coats uh, in the wintertime. Also, you had to, uh, if you wanted to get them um, to, to sell, you would have to wander out onto the, onto the plains, uh, which were controlled by these various tribes who would not be very friendly toward the idea. So now some, some tribes, some Indians did trade individual buffalo robes, but it was a very small, very small operation. And that changed. That changed as a result of something that happened in 1870 when a, uh, a new technique was perfected that uh, made tanning buffalo hides in particular for industrial purposes much, much easier to do. Um, and uh, it could be done in great numbers. So that gave the hides significant value because uh, with the ability to to tan them and turn them into really high quality leather. There was a demand for that, especially in Europe. Turns out buffalo hides, which are very thick, really good. And remember, we're not talking about, uh, not talking about the fur, but the hide underneath the fur. Um, turns out they're very, very good for making very durable shoe soles and for making very durable belts. And in particular, industrial belts that were used on heavy machinery. And um, bear in mind, this is around the time that second industrial revolution is, is kicking off. And uh, there's a lot of uh, factory expansion. So suddenly there's a big demand for buffalo hides. So what happened is that uh, enterprising... Uh, white people, particularly in the Southern Plains, um, started uh, going out and killing huge amounts of buffalo for their hides. Now, why in the Southern Plains? In part, because the Northern Plains were still pretty well controlled by the uh, Lakota and their allies. The Southern tribes by 1870 had at least nominally, except for the Quahati uh, Comanches, uh, gone onto the reservations, even though, you know, so far as whether they stayed there or not was, was a different story. But the real reason, the biggest reason that this took off in the Southern Plains was because of the Transcontinental Railroad, which passed through Kansas, right? That is why so many cattle towns sprung up in Kansas, like Dodge City and Abilene, because that's where the cowboys in Texas would drive their cattle. They would drive them up to Kansas because that's where the trains were. Well, that's also where the trains were to transport buffalo hides. So people started coming out uh, and hunting buffalo. And hunting is, uh, well, 
that's probably a bit of a bit of an exaggeration for for what it really was because you didn't really have to hunt for them you know a buffalo herd might have a hundred thousand animals in it not that hard to find and if you uh if you knew what you were doing and you played your cards right it wasn't hard just to shoot them all day long um you would have to have someone there pouring water over your rifle barrel to keep it from melting because you were shooting so much. And that's because, well, buffalo are noble creatures, but they're not that bright. Um, if you've got a herd and you start shooting the ones on the end, not the ones in the middle, but if you start shooting the ones on the end, the others don't pay much attention. And then you can work your way toward the middle and kill a whole lot of them before they really even, you know, notice what's going on because there's all that, there's all that uh, yummy grass to be, to be concerned with. So um, one hunter, one hunter in a season could kill thousands of buffalo. And well, in 1870, a buffalo hide was pretty much worthless. You couldn't get any money for it. By the next year, you could get two dollars and eighty cents for one hide, and those that that price kind of um, that price range stayed about the same for the next ten or fifteen years between two dollars and thirty cents and two dollars and eighty cents. So, average of two and a half bucks per hide. If you were working as a cowboy, and you were an experienced cowboy, you weren't just a a green hand. The best you could hope to make was maybe $50 a month. But you could go out and shoot thousands of buffalo and get uh, a couple of bucks a piece for them. So that's a lot of money. And that's a lot of temptation. Uh, a lot of people from all walks of life who lived in the uh, Southern Plains, we're talking about um, white people. Well, not all white, but non-Indians. Um, and a lot of people came into the area uh, expressly to get in on this because it was a guaranteed money-making venture. Um, so there were uh, buffalo just being slaughtered in huge, huge numbers. And um, the hides were being sold, uh, taken to the railway, shipped off to Europe uh, for... Uh, uh, the sale for leather for the most part, but uh, other parts were used as well. Their bones could be used to make glue, uh, just like horse and, and cattle bones. This is a famous photograph from 1892 of a giant mountain of buffalo skulls. Um, not in Kansas, but in Detroit. Well, probably uh, getting ready to go into the glue works. Another use uh, was buffalo tongue, which was regarded as a delicacy and was in great demand in a lot of restaurants in the eastern United States and in Europe. But now in 1870, the period that, that we're talking about right now, they weren't shipping the, the skeletons or the skulls off to Detroit. They were just killing thousands of them and skinning them, taking the hides, maybe the tongues, but leaving the rest there to rot. So here's the, uh, here's the numbers. In 1870, there were about five and a half million buffalo in the United States. By one decade later, it was 395,000. At the end of that decade, the 1880s, 541. And really, the only reason there were 541 left is that some ranchers who had buffalo on their property, particularly in the uh, northern plains, um, prevented, they kept them, they kept them, they prevented them from being uh, killed or, or processed just because they were a novelty, you know. Uh, by 1900, there were only 300. And then over the course of the 20th century, that number very, very slowly went up. And today, um, anywhere between 350,000, 400,000. Uh, so back to 1880 numbers, roughly.
This is obviously going to affect the Southern Plains tribes who are relying on these herds for their sustenance because, you know, even, even the Comanche, Kiowa, Southern Cheyenne, Southern Arapaho, who had gone onto the reservations in Western Oklahoma were still at that point, they were still allowed to go on buffalo hunts and they still were reliant almost completely on buffalo uh, to, to feed themselves and their people. So all of a sudden, thousands and thousands and thousands of buffalo being killed every day, of course that's going to impact them and it is going to create a lot of friction that is going to lead to a major Indian war. Now, I'm going to go ahead now and, and mention this, even though we're currently talking about the Southern Plains, just so that I don't forget later and because we're on the topic of buffalo. But later on, later in the 1870s, when the U.S. is at war with the Lakota Alliance in the Northern Plains, the U.S. Army will develop the policy, implement the policy of just killing buffalo, uh, as many as they can, wherever they can not because they're hunting them, not because they're taking their hides or anything else, just to kill the buffalo because they're trying to defeat the Lakotas and their Cheyenne and Arapaho allies. And the fastest way to help do that is to destroy their, their food supply. So that's not the intention in the Southern Plains in the early 1870s. It is just the practical effect. I mean, the fact is all those... Uh, former cowboys and former various other professions that are out there um, making money killing all these buffalo. They don't really care whether Indians can, can eat or not uh, because this is, uh, this is an opportunity for them uh, to, uh, well, to make a lot of money quickly. Let's take a look at several significant leaders among the Kiowa circa 1870. We've got um, pictured here Satanta, which means white bear, Satank, or sitting bear, and Wipago, alias lone wolf. Those three were known as the war leaders. Uh, there were other uh, leaders of other bands as well that operated with them, but they were the ones that... Uh, uh, principally in the late 1860s, early 1870s, were still engaging in raids. Uh, on the lower right, that guy, Ado Ete, a much younger uh, leader, much younger chief, alias Big Tree, uh, was one of those who followed the lead of what you might call the Big Three up there on top. And then you've got Tene Angopte, alias Kicking Bird, who was at this point known primarily for his peaceful intention, uh, his desire to be accommodating and to uh, basically to, to live, live peaceably, even though in his, uh, in his career he had been a military leader and had led many raids. Kicking Bird had signed on to the Medicine Lodge Treaty in 1867, uh, and uh, so had uh, Satanta, or White Bear. Uh, although Satanta signed on to it with the agreement he would lead his people onto that reservation in Oklahoma, and he was really slow in doing that. It didn't look like he was even going to, so Custer actually took him hostage until his people relocated to Oklahoma, uh, which probably... Uh, didn't improve Satanta's attitude toward the, uh, toward the treaty and the government very much. Anyway, um, after going on to the reservation, and by the way, Lone Wolf did not sign on to that treaty. Uh, he didn't agree to it. But uh, even those uh, who did come onto the reservation in Oklahoma uh, were, like I said, continuing to, to hunt buffalo and sometimes continuing to go on raids against settlers in the area. Um, Kicking Bird made the argument to the, to the Indian agents, the, the government agents, that if only the government would 
would provide the annuities they had promised and provide all of them and provide them on time, then maybe his people wouldn't be leaving the reservation uh, to go hunt for buffalo and, you know, be in the sort of bad mood that they were in. Now, some of these other ones, the, the uh, quote-unquote war leaders, um, didn't make excuses. Uh, they had no intention of no longer hunting buffalo. That was their lifestyle. And even though they were uh, theoretically supposed to be on, on the reservation all the time, they didn't pay too much, too much attention to that uh, because they, uh, they hadn't, many of them hadn't even, hadn't even agreed to do it. Uh, eventually, by the way, in 1870, Kicking Bird felt compelled because he was getting so criticized by the other Kiowa leaders for being a sellout, really, that um, he led a raid himself uh, against, a, against a ranch that uh, ended up um, having the uh, company of cavalry attacking them. And the uh, Kiowa under Kicking Bird actually got the upper hand and he demonstrated his his uh, martial skill that he had had when he was when he was younger and sort of saved face and by showing that he could still get out and fight um, people continued to to follow him but that was the last time kicking bird would engage in any violence uh, against against the United States and that was not the case for the rest of these guys on May 18th, 1871, a force of about 180 Kiowa warriors left the uh, reservation in western Oklahoma and went southward into Texas. They were led by Satanta, Satank, and Big Tree. They, uh, they came upon uh, a small uh, army, army convoy, uh, an ambulance and some attendants, 18 people total, and uh, decided to let it go go past. Um, there was some discussion as to whether or not to attack it, but it seemed like too small, like it was too small. Um, and so they let that one go because there was a larger wagon train further down the road. Now, the, uh, the military uh, that were the, the people who were in that, uh, that small convoy had no idea that they were under observation from 180 Kiowa warriors and almost, almost had been attacked. And um, it's, it, it's an interesting what if scenario because that little group of, of soldiers actually was the, uh, the bodyguard of General William Tecumseh Sherman, who was the commanding general of the United States Army stationed, of course, uh, in Washington, D.C., who had come out west to tour the forts uh, and see how things were going. So they almost had Sherman, but they let him go. Uh, and then later, when Colonel Ronald McKenzie of the 5th Cavalry informed Sherman of what had almost happened, uh, Sherman was incensed. He took it very personally that there had been unbeknownst to him, a very real threat on his life. Instead, the Kiowas attacked the wagon train that is known as the Warren wagon train. It was not a wagon train of settlers heading west or anything. It was actually Teamsters um, in the employ of Henry Warren, uh, who, was, who was along for the, for the ride here. He was an independent contractor who was working for the U.S. Army, and these wagons were delivering corn, actually, to uh, several different forts uh, along, along that route. Uh, there were uh, a dozen Teamsters all together, and they were, uh, they were attacked by these Indians, and they circled the wagons, literally, um, for, uh, for a better defense. They were, uh, they were attacked seven of the uh, seven of the teamsters were killed and uh, their bodies mutilated five of them managed to to get away uh, and report what had happened the uh, the the Kiowas meanwhile after this they they got 40 mules and uh, 
headed back north uh, and went back to the uh, back to the reservation. By the way, the uh, the illustration here is a painting titled "The Warren Wagon Train Raid," and it was uh, it, it was painted by Buck Taylor who played newly on Gunsmoke and occasionally shows up in the current TV series, Yellowstone. Uh, he's a pretty good artist in addition to being an actor. Sherman and McKenzie immediately set about trying to figure out who was involved in that raid and specifically who had led it. And they were helped significantly by the fact that uh, Satanta was going around bragging that it had been him, Satonk, and Big Tree, and that uh, word of that got out pretty quickly. So troops were sent to Fort Sill to uh, to arrest those those three chiefs. When uh, when Lone Wolf became aware of this, he armed himself to the teeth and showed up to defend his friends. But turned out uh, turns out there were a whole lot of soldiers because Sherman came personally and personally. Uh, arrested and handcuffed these three chiefs and ordered them to be sent to Jacksboro, Texas to stand trial for murder. This, would, uh, this was going to be the first time that uh, any Native American leaders in the West would be tried in a federal court. Now, this is different from what happened in Minnesota with the Dakota Uprising because those were those were local courts. This is a federal court. So they are, uh, uh, they're handcuffed and they're to be transported to Jacksboro, Texas. Um, Satonk was to be transported by wagon. Actually, they all were, I think, separately. Anyhow, he was the only one in this particular wagon and he refused to get in it. He had no intention of being put on a, uh, a sham trial. Uh, and he said that his relatives would find his body along the road before he would show up for a trial. So he was forced into the wagon. He was thrown into the back of it. And he had with him a red blanket. And he just sort of uh, covered himself over with his blanket and huddled in the corner of the wagon. And the soldiers assumed that, uh, you know, he was, he was distraught and he was trying to hide his face in humiliation but he was actually hiding the fact that he was gnawing away at his own wrists, uh, biting the flesh off his own wrists so he could slip out of those handcuffs and get at the, uh, the knife that he had hidden in his clothing. And eventually along the road, he did, he did just that. And he came out from under that uh, red blanket with his knife and stabbed and killed one of the guards and grabbed his gun and then went down in a hail of bullets from the other troops before he had an opportunity to fire. So he did not uh, go through the humiliation of being put on trial. He went down fighting. The other two, Satanta and Big Tree, were taken and they were tried and they were convicted and they were sentenced to death. Now, this is uh, 1871. This is toward the end of Grant's first administration. He had already put his peace policy in place, and he had already put Quakers in charge of uh, Indian affairs. And some of those Quakers prevailed upon the governor of Texas to commute the sentences of these two Kiowa leaders to life in prison rather than execution. So they were taken, uh, they were taken to prison. Lone Wolf and Kicking Bird both started working immediately to try to affect the release of Satanta and Big Tree. Uh, in fact, Lone Wolf uh, traveled to Washington, D.C. And, and spoke directly with President Grant. Finally, after uh, two years, in September 1873, the two of them were released from prison and allowed to return to the reservation. Adoete, alias Big Tree, um, 
that was enough for him. Uh, he had had enough adventure to last him, I guess, for a while. So he didn't get involved in any of the activities that took place after that, uh, so far as resistance to the U.S. government. And he would remain uh, a chieftain of his band until he died about 50 years later. Uh, Satanta was a different story. So they'd been in prison two years. They go back home and buffalo are very, very, very scarce by this point. And many Kiowa and their Comanche and Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho allies are getting pretty fed up with it. And Satanta, Satanta gets involved with what happens next. <laughs> 